Right. Uh, welcome to my talk on intrinsic geometry. Uh, I'd like to start this by thanking Duan and his team for getting us all together here um, for this great event. Um, to start my talk, I'm just going to quickly contextualize sort of my position in computational design in New Balance and how computational design in New Balance worked. So we're a relatively small team uh, with Ona Gunn, who's the director. Director of Computation. The rest of us have a range of backgrounds, uh, including architecture, engineering, and industrial design. My background's more in uh, art and design, with a heavy focus on computational design. Uh, this sort of specialism allows us to sort of focus on a wide range of problems across the company. Specifically, my role, I look at developing custom computational design tools. These can be either to make data more accessible across the company to a wide range of colleagues, or developing uh, custom, de custom, uh, custom design tools for the uh, for uh, non-computational designers within the company. Um, through um, this platform, I used I, to create this. I used platforms, various platforms, including writing custom plugins for Grasshopper, and then fully fledged C plus plus or JavaScript web tools. Um, Okay, so now into intrinsic geometry. So to quickly, hopefully, yeah, we're back. Okay, so just to contextualize what intrinsic geometry is or what I mean by that term, uh, I just wanted to run through basically a quick sort of tutorial slash definition. So to define intrinsic geometry, I'm going to ex define it in contrast to what, what or against what it is. It is not. Um, so. I'm sure everyone here is pretty comfortable and familiar with ex explicit geometry or oh, extrinsic geometry. So this idea that you define shapes by points within space and these points are uh, sort of defined as a distance in each axis from the origin. This is a very, very powerful technique for um, cr rapidly creating shapes. Um, however, it does have its limitations in the fact it doesn't know a lot about the shape, the surface beyond that. So, <clears throat> what, what do I mean by this? Um, if, if you were to try and create a sort of a texture or a surface treatment like the one seen on the screen above, um, you'd often find that it's quite hard to get the um, from a purely explicit method. It's very hard hard to get the uh, the pattern to follow with the surface. However. Intrinsic geometry is kind of the opposite. It doesn't care about where the shape is in space. It really just cares about what the shape is and what information is stored in it. So within this regard, it's sort of like what the shape knows about itself. We're probably all quite familiar with normals. This is one example of intrinsic geometry. Um, however, there's a whole sort of range of, of other um, features, including like curvature, as shown in the main image on the screen. Um, Something like heat, heat, the heat kernel signature, which is a shaped signature, uh, sort of a unique marker for every shape, or geodesic distances, so distances as the shortest distances measured along the surface rather than within 3D space, which would be a sort of straight line. To sort of show an example of how this can be useful in the real world, I've uh, <coughs> put together this. So we have this simple formula for creating a pattern on the surface. Um, and we have two cases. So this first case is the external or the extrinsic example, um, whereby every the the sort of x values that you put into this function are defined by the z or y component, depending on your software choice. Um, and you end up, as a result, with this sort of banded stripe pattern running up the bunny. In the intrinsic one, I chose to use the geodesic distance from an arbitrary point on the mesh to every vertice. Instead, you get this sort of radiating pattern. But notably, this is the only thing that's changed. It's exa exactly the same formula, exactly the same process. It's just whether we, which, what data we use. The interesting side is when we start to rotate or move this object through space, the intrinsic geometry in the intrinsic we're using an intrinsic property, the, the pattern stays exactly the same and doesn't change, whereas the pattern morphs or moves across the surface in the extrinsic case. Uh, this can be thought of as because when we're working intrinsically, we're defining the pattern on the surface, whereas in the extrinsic, we're projecting. 
<coughs> this is particularly useful in New Balance, um, as we often deal with sort of data, uh, geometry from the wild, so to speak. So things like uh, foot scans um, uh, can be uh, <coughs> can we can, we can't necessarily orientate. We can't oh, sorry. We can't uh, guarantee that when we get the models, they're going to be in the same orientation, scale, or even position. As a result when wanting to work on something, if we can define it, when we're wanting to process something, if we define it within the intrinsic world, we don't have to worry about these things and we don't have to perform expensive computational techniques like shape registration. So very quickly, I thought this quote was particularly apt for how it feels when you start looking at the intrinsic world, uh, the intrinsic shapes. So um, this idea that there's a world of, a world in a grain of sand, there's a whole world of properties when you start looking at intrinsically that can be used as design tools. Um, <clears throat> so for the rest of my presentation, I'm just going to quickly, uh, I'm going to just gonna go through two other intrinsic properties that I think are really useful and have been useful within my work. So the first of these is uh, smooth vector fields. Vector fields generally aren't inherently intrinsic. Um, they can be entirely arbitrary. Um, however, smooth vector fields very much are, as they are defined in the tangent, uh, tangent to the surface. Um, they're also, there's also another aspect that sort of makes them intrinsic, um, and this was sort of proven by the, mathemat the mathematician Henri Poincaré, I don't know, I can't pronounce very well, so sorry about that, uh, in 1885. Um, who proved what I think is the best named mathematical theorem in the world ever, um, the hairy ball theorem. Simply put, this states that if you have a ball that's covered in hair and try and comb it smooth, you will, it will never be fully smooth. There will always be hair sticking up at one point. This idea that every shape has this hidden sort of smoothest way of moving around it um, is super interesting to me and I think um, but it's also more than just a vaguely interesting esoteric area of maths. It has pretty established roots with things like uh, creating flow, field, flow, uh, flow lines, um, used for like texture mapping and aligning textures to sort of reduce things like uh, seams, um, and also for aligning objects on top of surfaces in a smooth way, so then it all flows as shown on the right hand side. So this is my a personal project I worked on a while ago. This isn't a New Balance thing. We haven't broken into jewelry yet, but um, and it's my one and only nod to the add additive manufacturing side of CD Fam. Um, this uh, I was interested. This was inspired by the Omri and Care thing uh, stuff, and um, also I was in interested in what was the minimal amount of components we could use to create an interesting and complex design. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so the process for this was simply start off with two two inputs. You have a single a curve that you've defined on a surface, and the surface itself. Um, you first create the smooth vector field on the surface, and then also sample the curve at various points and get the tangent at that point, and then propagate that across the mesh using parallel transport. After this, um, you just have a weight to control how much those tangent, tangential directions affect the original smoothest curve. This was added so that then there was a sort of des design element and you weren't just working with this pure uh, smooth vector field. And then finally, you very simply populate it random, the surface randomly with points and move uh, or advect the points through the vector field um, using Euler integration in order to create these sort of dynamic uh, and sort of interesting, I think, uh, geometries. Um, I think the important thing was that this sort of felt like the minimal thing you could do at all. I was like providing just two pieces of geometry to create this. Um, and also it was incredibly quick. Um, right, so the second uh, property I want to talk about is the Cotan Laplacian. So simply put, the Cotan Laplacian is a surface operator which acts like diffusion on a surface. A bit more complex way of talking about it is that it also is a matrix, a square matrix, that encodes both connectivity and curvature of our shape. The animation you can see on the screen um, 
shows an example of this diffusion running. So if you imagine the initial state is with this like very hot, uh, this point being heated in the center of the mesh, then over time as you apply the Laplacian to the mesh, you find that it spreads out. Many people will have, here will have come across this inadvertently through mesh smoothing in softwares like Blender, um, but I think it's a useful tool for design. I don't want to get too much into the math. People can talk to me about this afterwards if they want. Um, but the notable thing about the Cotan Laplacian for my work is the fact that it's very sparse. What I mean by this is it's mostly filled with zeros, and uh, as such, is this is because values are, co are calculated on edges. Um, and if a point, two points don't share an edge, then there's no value there. Um, and in a mesh, most, most points aren't connected. This is important because computers are very, very efficient, very efficient at dealing with matrices and particularly sparse matrices. So what can we do with this? Um, when we look at, I figured when thinking of an example of how to use this, I figured the obvious one was reaction diffusion, given the fact that I said this was a diffusion layer. Um, as you can see, this is reaction diffusion running on a relatively heavy mesh um, in, in sort of real time, and it has user input. The user can paint chemicals onto the surface. Um, this is a real example of how the cotan Laplacian can be incredibly quick, um, allowing for this real time stuff. You might, some of you who are particularly New Balance fans might be like, well, we've seen New Balance use reaction diffusion before. Um, which is true. We worked with Nervous System um, a few years ago to create a reaction diffusion tool. However, this tool ran in 2D and just created, in, and created an image, um, which would then be mapped up onto the surface of the mesh. There's many benefits in this approach, including it's quite easy to implement, it runs very quick, and you can get very high resolutions. However, there are also some big limitations. So very quickly, one of the, these tend to be that there's distortion in the mesh, uh, in, the, in the geometry. This is because areas of the mesh get stretched when they're flattened or they get compressed when they're flattened. The other one is seams. Um, this is not such a much of a problem if you're using tileable textures, but when talking about patterns like reaction diffusion, it wouldn't tend to be. Uh, possible to tile them. And then finally, it doesn't react to the surface at all. It has no information about the surface. Um, you can solve some of these problems, so you could re reduce distortion, but you'll inevitably add more seams. So trying to find a way that it runs purely in 3D is kind of super important. So when talking about how the shape can inform the reaction diffusion, um, I figured I'd create an example of this. So on the left-hand side, there's an image where I've just run, I've just got the shape index for each vertex. Basically, the shape index, it tells me if a, at that point the curvature is flat, concave, or convex, um, with concave being black and convex being gold. That <coughs> You can't really see the, the flat area because it's not very flat. And then on the right-hand side, you, uh, I use these values to alter how the reaction diffusion worked in those, it depended on the value. And as you can see, different the concave areas get sort of this spotty print, whereas the convex get more of a sort of like the traditional sort of maze-like pattern. But this isn't all you have. Oh, oh, oh. There you go. Uh, this isn't like, it's not limited to reaction diffusion. You can run various other partial differential equations directly on the mesh this way. So on the left, the wave equation, which sort of simulates waves moving through a medium. And on the right, this is reaction diffusion, but just not the Gray Scott model. Um, but there's a whole world of PDEs you could run. So very quickly, I just figured I'd give a list of a few little resources if you're interested in this. Lionfish, you can download from Food for Rhino. Um, it's, uh, has various features, including creating smooth vector fields and geodesic distances. It's also a little plug because, for myself, because this was my plugin. Um, and then if you're into the sort of coding side, I think Geometry Central and LibIGL are great resources, and they offer far more powerful features than I've managed to build yet into Lionfish. Just some takeaways. I'd say think intrinsically. Look, at, look into what your shape knows about itself beyond what you would initially expect. Once you do this, you might find that you've got sort of powerful tools for sort of making your design and controlling your designs more and sort of more sophisticated control of your designs. Smooth vector fields are fun. There's all sorts of possibilities. They're very quick um, and they can create sort of 
they can help massively with things like alignment on the surface in a smooth way, in a natural way. Crotalan laplacian is very powerful. It can do more than just run things on. There's a whole, I would really look into, recommend looking into it. There's a whole world of stuff you can do with it. Also, if you combine smooth or tangential vector fields and Crotalan laplacian, you can probably run full fluid simulations on a mesh. Shape driven patterns allow the shape to drive what you put onto it um, rather than just prescribing what should be on it. I think this can often lead to much more interesting and organic looking designs. Um, expand the creative possibilities. Think with all of these things, I think you should hopefully be able to expand creative possibilities <laughs> and explore the hidden world. I've gone through intrinsic geometry. Um, I don't think that this by, by any means is all. There's whole areas of math to do with geometry, which are super interesting and I'd look at. Um, but yeah, look, look for the hidden stuff, as I think, um, as designers, engineers, and uh, artists, we should be largely trying to look for the stuff that hasn't been done, rather than stuff that has been done before. Thank you. To learn more about the CDFAM Computational Design Symposium series, to see the archives of previous presentations, and to learn about future events, visit cdfam.com.